Okay, well, I figured I'd get started. So, hope everybody is doing well today. And that being Becca, hope you're doing great. <laughs> so, I wanted to present to you my, or really, Unorthodoxicals debut recital entitled Diverse Disperation. So, just now, when having an orthodoxical, it can be described in a number of ways, but I wanted to keep it down to at least two words. And some of the ways that I try to describe what it is have been, how should I say, challenging just to find the right word to say. So I've described it as a nomadic performance. My advisor, Blair Corner, described it as a lecture recital. Showing this to, di to direct friends, they believe you're I'm just analyzing works. Others have said it's, it's good for having direct interaction. But I like to say it is methodically unorthodox. Now, what I would like to preface with this debut recital is I want to focus on what diversity, equity, and inclusion can look like or sound like in the classical space. So I pose four thoughts here. What can DEI in playing music look like? What can DEI sound like in music? And how can musicians be equitable and inclusive? How can we do better as a music society? So as we ponder these four questions, I want to take you on a journey. So first, before I say anything more, I'm going to play a video of a song that I was able to put together. And then I'm gonna ask you questions based on that after giving a little more intro or a little more information on the piece itself or the performance itself. And make sure I can make sure you all can hear this in one second. Please let me know if you can hear it. There's no sound. Oh no. Okay. <laughs> okay. Try again. Can't believe I'm still messing this up, even as being on Zoom for so long. <laughs> okay, one second. Do, 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 do. There we go, share sound.
moving. So if you didn't know, that was a bassoon. <laughs> so now take that instrument, for example. I cannot tell you how many times that has been called an oboe. Now, for those in the audience, if you can, raise your hand if you knew what a bassoon was before this recital lecture. <laughs> Yay, great, awesome. Now, for those of you who don't know, it's okay. There's no, there's no shame in being ignorant because trust me, I didn't even know what a bassoon was at all before I started picking it up. So when you're not only just gonna be subjected to my pieces, I should say, but I want you to really consider the significance behind each one. I want each and every one of you to even participate in the recital itself. But how do we do that? I can, we can do that by engaging in topics that musical professionals seem to shy away from or circumvent. So as we all do, all know, we all love music. And I promise you, I may not know the answers to these hot topics, but unorthodoxical aims to open the door to these social issues through this interactive lecture. So the first piece was a postmodern bassoon sonata by Daniel Baldwin called Rhapsody. I want you all to think about what the word Rhapsody means. Second. So what do we think of this piece? Any thoughts so far? Any thoughts? Concerns? <laughs> I liked the play on like between the two of you and you each had your moments to shine mm -hmm. pretty consistently. You just, it was kind of like a conversation between each instrument. Exactly, for sure. And I wanted to really focus on what does music look like or what it can look like, especially for budding musicians such as you and I. So Daniel Baldwin was actually born in Blackwell, Oklahoma and he's still living as of today. He is renowned for his Pathway series that focuses on a variety of diverse repertoire in the band, orchestra, and choir setting. Now, besides that, I wanted to, again, what does Rhapsody mean, right? But when I was picking this piece, I really wanted to focus on something that sounded like it was standard rep, but at the same time, it wasn't. So how can I focus on something like that while trying to still bring this about. So after conversing with Daniel Baldwin himself, he actually wrote this piece for tuba and piano. However, after literally some prodding from a fellow colleague, he got it transcribed for bassoon and piano. So when people think of any type of bassoon piece, it's always the Mozart's bassoon concerto. And let me tell you, I hate that piece. So much, so much. And I know it's a standard piece of classical repertoire, but it's just so dull to me. And I'm not gonna apologize for that. I, I have gotten so much scorn from some of my musical peers and professors, but I, I simply cannot stand it. And it's just, that's just one example of a piece of classical music that just feels cliche to me. And I wanted to wonder how I can elevate my musicianship while maintaining my aversion of the classical repertoire. So one of the ways I thought of that was through rhythm, right? As you heard, there's a lot of percussiveness in this song, a lot of play with the piano and the bassoon itself. And I decided to do something out of the ordinary, which was choosing this sonata. And as you know, most works today are kind of post-tonal, but I don't know if that's the right word to describe this piece. Most composers begin to bend or blend that definition. However, is that better or worse than playing a stereotypical sonata from the classic or even romantical era? Again, there are so many editions of Mozart's bassoon concerto, but what do you think? Should musicians nowadays focus on the standard repertoire or focus on newer music? Is there a balance? Should there not be a balance? What do we think? I mean, my personal preference is a balance because I have likes and dislikes in both sides of the spectrum. But I think when it comes to like new musicians, whatever gets them into music and whichever allows them to communicate and be expressive and makes them feel what they, what they are hoping to feel from music, I say, go for it. Um, so if that means 
not classical music. They can take a whole route of non-classical, but if classical music speaks to them, I mean, I think there's value in the education side of it, just from like technique wise, um, especially if they are wanting to play certain uh, types of instruments, but also I don't think it's necessary. So I think it's, yeah, I think there's a fine balance between the two. And I think it's important for musicians not to be so focused on one with blinders. So they're unaware of other art that's happening um, as well as unaware of the talent that's around them, even if it's not in the same genre of music or if it's a genre that they consider to be lesser than whatever they specialize in. I think it's important to be acknowledging talent wherever, and art wherever we are. Yeah, I completely agree. I've met many musicians, and I'm pretty sure you have as well, where they, they want to focus on just the classical pieces. But now, as you know, most uh, conservatories and colleges, they focus, they, they, there's like a nice little, like a, I guess, niche or focus, again, on newer music, right? Because, you know, we're living through the times, and I'm pretty sure in the future, there's going to be like another focus on even newer music. So now I want to re rewind the clock a bit as I demonstrated the light of the 1900s. There are three pieces composed by William Grant Still. So for those of you who might be unaware, William Grant Still is renowned as the Dean of Afro-American Composers, composing over 200 works, especially famous for his Afro-American Symphony, which was produced by New York City Opera and actually debuted in Rochester itself. Isn't that absolutely crazy? Now, despite all of his accomplishments, he still cannot escape the per persecution he, as a black male face in the mid-1900s. He even had to drive all the way down to Tijuana, Mexico, just to marry his wife, pianist Verna Avery, as interracial marriages were illegal in the state of California at the time. Now, for many people of color, just to have your way of life restricted based on the color of your skin or culture, it can feel so desolating, wandering and wondering for some sense of belonging. In fact, you're going to hear those thoughts of isolation and yearning for home throughout the next three pieces I'm going to play for you. They are Buy You Home, If I Should Go, and Songs for the Lonely.
Okay, so thank you. Jess, I wanted to really, you know, emphasize something that let's look at this picture of William Grant Stone himself. Very vibrant, still in his youth. Yet all the pictures that I was able to find of him were always in black and white. Yet he only died in 1978. Yet you could find many colorized photos of a majority of white or European composers. Now, whether that is some type of indication for how we view people of color back in the day to make them look a little older, or whether that's not the case. But I really wanted to focus on these three questions. Do you think we can feel the emotions of the composers through their music? Do you think those same feelings by people of color years ago can still be felt today? And then lastly, do we think that people of color still face similar plights as those years ago? You all are welcome to share any thoughts you all might have. I say yes to all three questions. Um, emotions are emotions and they haven't changed over the course of time. Um, maybe the causes of why we feel certain things will vary and, and change depending on the times or whatever and the challenges that we the unique challenges we face because of the time period we live in but in general i think that's the beautiful thing about music and why yeah music written 400 years ago is still enjoyed today because we feel the same things and it connects us over the course of time even just like 100 years ago or 50 years ago it was a very different world then and in some ways but um so yeah i think we can still feel the emotion of the composer or even other emotions that maybe the composer didn't intend initially but they're felt anyways and i think no matter what you feel it's valid um and the same goes for the second feeling um i can't like speak for people of color but from the stories i've been told and um, the experiences of trying to, you know, uh, educate myself and expose myself, I think those same feelings are very still existent and same with the struggles and the plights and the challenges, the social challenges still exist. Maybe they, they come up in different ways, but they all, they still exist for sure. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate you opening up about this because, as you know, it's almost difficult or even infamous to even talk about issues like this in the musical space. We can learn about these things in classes, but they only show one side of this complex issue. How can we even imagine orchestras, professional musicians, to combat or face these things? So this brings me to the last piece, which is entitled Ghost Dance for solo bassoon. And this piece is very personal to me because the Native American ghost dance is a part of a religious ceremony for the regeneration of earth and the restoration of the care caretakers of the earth to their former life. So the religion experienced is fullest and most widespread practice during the late 19th century when devastation to buffalo herds, the land and Native American tribes was at its peak. Ghost dance affected no group more than the Lakota Sioux. Several Lakota bands sent emissaries to interview its founder and priest Wovoka about his teachings, and they reported in the early 1890s that Wovoka's message that performing a ghost dance would bring back dead Indians, return the huge buffalo herds, and create a natural disaster that would remove the foreigners and restore the Indian way of life that has existed prior to the European influx. And this dance is not an incitement to war or violence, but it's more of a passionate plea for freedom and return to the lands and life. And these treaties intended to bring peace were often ignored by the colonizers of that time. And tribes have been rounded up and herded on to reservations, which were typically the poorest lands in the territory that yielded no crops or any type of life. And then they were subjected to near prison camp-like regulations, mind you, and restrictions 
and most of their requests were just largely ignored or refused. And although practiced by Lakota tribe in Canada until the 1960s and revived briefly in South Dakota in the 1970s, ghost dances were basically ended in the 1890s by the U.S. 7th Cavalry at the Wounded Knee Massacre of 297. And over 300 Lakota men, women, and children were dancing during the ceremony when they were all slaughtered. And unfortunately today, there are still the remains of those types of treatment. Just recently, the Dakota pipeline invasion. With the use and destruction of Native American lands that were granted through treaties, which are now inconvenient. And beyond that barely acknowledged unjust activity, the bigotry, the racial hatred, the denial of voting rights, and probable unconstitutional treatment of Native Americans still continue to this day. So this is a musical transcription of what a ghost dance would sound like.
So yeah, that was Ghost Dance, and it was composed by Anne Geber, born in Des Moines, Iowa, 1945, and I had to include that she was a Texas citizen because she currently lives there now. Those of you who don't know, I am in Texas, proud Texan e Hall, and she currently teaches at Houston Baptist University in Houston. So now, this was an indigenous piece of music, yet it was written by a white woman. Now, I am very happy to play a piece by a woman composer, but this brings into the next and final topic, which is how can we fix the injustices against people of color through music? And should modern composers create pieces that are not a part of their culture? And how should we represent music from other cultures or demographics? Anybody want to share their thoughts? This is a really hard topic because, because now we live in a time where there are people from a variety of cultures who have had, who are wanting to share their art and want to share their stories. Um, there is the issue of people not having the same opportunities to receive like the education um, or the knowledge needed to write it down, but at the same time in the age of the internet and stuff like that, people can produce things in their own ways um, and as creatively as they want. Um, as for the first question, I think just bringing light to these issues and playing works of music by um, POC composers and artists and poets and everything in between. Um, should modern composers create pieces that are not part of their culture? That's the hard question, because like this piece that you just played, obviously it brought exposure to the issue and the event that, that happened, but as I'm assuming she, has she ever experienced an actual ghost dance? She probably has attended one maybe, but does she have the same spiritual connection to something like that or even to the event? Um, granted, she could have had a lot of conversations with, with people who've mm -hmm. experienced it and are using her as like, uh, in between to communicate this. Um, it definitely does context by context. Um, but like, for instance, there, there's a situation where an opera company in California decided to produce a new work of opera called the Emmett Till story, but it was written by a white woman. And the issue wasn't so much that it was written by a white woman, but it was the story of the white woman in the mm -hmm. Emmett Till story and mm -hmm. placed her as a victim within the story, um, which is problematic. <laughs> so yeah. I think it's kind of, yeah, what sort of narrative are you trying to tell? Mm -hmm. If it's outside of your culture, are you trying to put your own whitewashing mm -hmm. over it? Or are you trying to amplify it? Are you like the right parts of it? Mm -hmm. It's no. a difficult question. <laughs> it is, I completely agree because when it comes to music, there's a fine line of appreciation and appropriation as we all know. And of course, there's not really a straight answer to it. But just even talking about it, just like we are right now, yeah. again, helps build that exposure and really just gets the issue out there, right? And that's really mostly what musicians can do at that time. And the answer is going to be different for everybody, but it's an answer regardless, and that should be appreciated. Now, again, what can DEI in playing music look like? What does it sound like? How can we be equitable and inclusive? But how can we do better? Now, we don't have to answer that. But these are just food for thought into what we can do as musicians, right? Every way that we can go about answering this is different. We see opera companies, again, composing new works. We see uh, other uh, composers start creating pieces just like Ghost Dance. We see listeners starting to expose themselves to different genres of music that might make them uncomfortable at first, but they grow to appreciate and like. There's no one correct answer to do this. And that's the beauty, but the challenge when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion in music. And even just doing this recital today, it was a journey. I wanted to do something different, unconventional, 
as you probably noticed, the background of each performance was completely different because I wanted to do something unconventional. I didn't want to present music in this in this the standard, oh, we're in a concert hall, we're gonna do this, X, Y, and Z. Why does it have to be like that? Why does music have to be the way it is now? I don't have an answer for that. I can only just share my experience. And I'm sure for any musicians out there, that's all you can do. Trying to find the best way to express yourself musically, artistically, or personally. But whatever that is, you just have to make sure that it is unorthodoxical. So I hope you all enjoyed today's performance and I thank you all for coming so much.